Ladies and gentlemen, we're here at Mixed Mental Arts with uh, the great Andrew Keene. His book, <laughs> How to Fix the Future, came to me in the mail. I didn't even know, and I started reading it, and uh, I went, oh boy. And uh, but I have to say, first of all, Andrew, author of three books that I, that I know of, The Internet is Not the Answer, The Cult of the Amateur, and now How to Fix the Future. I started by reading How to Fix the Future, and I started very pessimistically. I sort of thought, oh my God, well, that's it, we're done. And then the book ends in a lot of ways on a high note. There is hope for us after all. Um, and I told you when I came into this hotel room, this intimate hotel room, <laughs> that I was, this was probably going to be an hour long ass kissing session because I'm always amazed at some people who can kind of like draw from the entire, <laughs> the wor world history to make their point and draw these sort of amazing sort of, uh, uh, you know, parallels between do we need regulation for the internet? Well, we had to regulate food and we had to regulate. There are a lot of things that we've, uh, we, we are better for because we've had to regulate. So uh, car safety, unsafe at any speed. And now maybe the internet is becoming unsafe at any speed. Anyway, Andrew Keen. Andrew Keen, welcome to Mixed Mental Arts. Is he always this nice to the people on your show? No, he's actually mostly rude to people. So this really <laughs> I is a shove them around. I shove them around. I think I'm being set up. Here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're not. You're not. You, you're. You're. Um, you're dealing with a very, very important, maybe the most important problem. I would say. Well, it's certainly. How would you define the problem? Let's let me interview you. I, I would define <laughs> the problem first of all in 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 that if you look at. Amazon, Apple, Google, um, Microsoft, Microsoft, and uh, Facebook. Facebook. You're talking about not only the concentration of power like we've never seen, uh, but you're talking about uh, they, they not only own our data and our information, but they're controlling our geography. They are controlling the map. It has become privatized. And the only saving grace in a lot of ways, and I think you do a good job of, of pointing this out, is that Carnegie, etc. The old Robert Barons weren't necessarily very altruistic and weren't very, um, you know, civic-minded. I mean, even though they founded universities and things after they, you know, but well, well into their 80s or whatever. At least people like Zuckerberg and Tim Cook, and and the rest are aware that there is a problem. Are they? Um, well, well, it's very hard though to get the emperor to give up, you know, all yeah. his power. Yeah, but I think some of them are more mature than others. I mean, it'd be interesting to know if Steve Jobs was around, how he would feel. I just did a podcast with Cara Swisher, who I'm sure you all know, she's probably the leading journalist in Silicon Valley. She's the most networked. And she knew Steve Jobs quite well. Uh, in fact, she was the one who interviewed Jobs and Gates when they did the live event in it was probably 2008. It was an amazing experience. I was there. And I said to her, if Jobs was around, would he have got the problem? And she said, yes, I'm not so sure, because he wasn't so much into making the world a better place. No. He was just into himself. Yeah. So they're all different. You know, Cook, I think, is probably the most well-meaning. But I also think Apple is probably, they're not an ideal company, but they're the least problematic because their business model is a better business model than Google and Facebook. They're not a data company. Mm. So we actually buy our iPhones. We buy our, our Apple computers. Uh, so the relationship with machines. The, yeah, the relationship yeah. with the consumer is, is simpler. The problem with Google and Facebook in particular is that they're turning all of us into products because they give away this stuff for free. And yet they're the ones doing the watching. So we use the term surveillance capitalism. And that is a, a huge problem, I think. Yeah, because you say the goal of the book is to create. First of all, the other, the, 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 to continue with what the problem is, is that the Internet was supposed to be the, the great democratizer. It was supposed yeah. to be a, a democracy. It is not anymore. It just isn't. And, you know, as, a, as somebody who puts out content, as somebody who's about to shoot his third special, stand-up special. I don't see any money. Well, in a know. way, yeah, and I'm, look, I'm not the, the right person probably to defend the internet. In a way, look, the internet's great. We wouldn't be doing this without the internet. Yeah. Um, it does allow, it, in a sense, it's democratizing. Anyone can publish on Twitter or Facebook. Anyone can use Google. Mm -hmm. There's no entry fee. Anyone now can post their videos on YouTube. The problem is, is the YouTubes and the Facebooks and the Googles are all powerful. They're controlling the platforms. And as you they're suggested, they're- They're also not paying they're, artists. Right, they're not paying artists. So that's a huge issue. It's one of the great 
illusions, I think, about the internet revolution. It's supposed to be good for artists, and it isn't. I mean, we're in L.A. We're not in San Francisco. There aren't any artists left in San Francisco. Mm -hmm. Either they're on the street or they've been forced out of their homes. All the money's in tech. It's not in creativity. Right. So it hasn't been. The internet has not been great for creatives like you. You're not making money from this? Well, I make money. Well, what about some nice sponsors? Don't yeah, you? yeah, yeah. No, I do make money. On my other podcast, Fighter and Kid, I make... Um, I make a lot of money. Good. Because we have sponsors and stuff. So there's no question. Why don't you no have question. sponsors on this? We will. We're about to get sponsors, actually. We just haven't gone out and really, uh, you know, we always say this is this is for the love of the game. Um, but uh, as we get more and more downloads, which, which you know, we're getting to a point where now. But even you guys, I mean, you were boasting on your, um, yeah, how many how many viewers do you get on your other one? 11 million? The downloads about 11 million. 12 it hasn't million. gone up to 12. It's gone up to 12 now. Yeah. Yeah. Something crazy. <laughs> I, the, the numbers are all changing. By the time anyone list, watches this, it'll be 14 million. Well, well, I know I know this because I had to give those numbers to... Uh, uh, I hope they're accurate. It? Yeah, I had to give You're those numbers to... You're not adding a few million here To Budweiser, I think, because they wanted right. to do something for them. So. But seriously... For, you know, whatever it is, 10, 11, 12 million, that's a huge deal. Yeah, it is. And you're part of the new aristocracy. The kid in the bedroom who's watching this, he says, oh, I want to do a podcast. Not going to be able to afford all this equipment. They don't have your brand or your skills. So even in terms of the democratization of media, there's only a few winners. There's only a few YouTube right. stars. And they're the new superstars. The problem with the digital revolution is it's destroyed the middle. It's destroyed the middle in every sense. So we mm -hmm. have a huge kind of underclass. We have a few celebrity superstars like you and I that's like it. That super, say superstar again. Let me get my hand. Superstar. Let me get my hand on my pants on that. No, I, but 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 by the way, yes, on, yes. But let me give you an example of. <laughs> let me give you an example of how that's not true. Yes, I, I I do very well with the podcast, and luckily I have this following with stand up. But what I'm saying is that if I let's shoot my laugh. special, let's not. Let's let's do away. We're in L.A. You can show off. Okay. Well, you're I'm, talented, I, this right? Is about, this is about you. Yes. And you worked hard. Yes. And you're talented, yes. and you deserve to be compensated for your work. Yeah. That when you say that in Silicon Valley, people think you're an elitist. I remember I was on again name dropping here, but I was on the Stephen Colbert show mm. in 2007 after Cult of the Amateur. You know his whole spiel, his joke. He's brilliant. And at one point, he leaned over the table and he pointed at me and said, "You, sir, you're an elitist." And I said, sure, what's wrong with that? <laughs> and after that, I became you know Nazi number one on the internet, as if I was. I'm protecting guys like you who are talented, who work hard, who deserve to be rewarded, compensated well, for their and, work. And you make that distinction in The Cult of the Amateur very well, and, and which is you have this great metaphor. Well, it's, it's Huxley's metaphor of the infinite monkey. And you have where, where, and for you guys that don't know it, if you had an infinite number of monkeys banging away at a typewriter, eventually one of them is going gonna, is gonna, to, uh, by accident, type out a masterpiece. But, you a know, I was naive back then. When I said in 2007... I was talking about the monkeys. I never imagined that most of those monkeys would be paid by Vladimir Putin, <laughs> which is the reality now. Yeah. We don't even know whether those monkeys are in the pay of Putin or ExxonMobil yeah. or Google. Who knows? You who don't they really know where are. We don't from. even know whether they're just machines, bots. Yeah. So, but it has also, uh, because, it, because everybody has a voice now, considered judgment. You used some words that I liked the way you said it. Considered judgment, expertise, things that, you know, um, that you that you can moor into, where, where you've actually rationally weighed the pros and cons, done your research, looked at all the data, and, and, and come up with some deductive reasoning. That's what, obviously, your books are about. I mean, you've done so much research in these books. And that is... That is rare, or maybe it's you can't maybe put it's that not. on Twitter, right? No, you can't. You can't. And to get and by the way, you know, to to you have to earn. My father used to always say, "You should earn your opinion. Your opinion should not be based on attitude, but on thought, on immersing yourself." in the best that's been thought and your father worked for the CIA is that true yeah, well listen just you keep waking up free every morning and he'll do what he does how's that sound Andrew alright you know what move in this isn't going well move in and the door busts open you're gonna put a hood over his head I, I gotta talk to him we gotta debrief we're gonna take a pause get the water board please it's not gonna be that big a deal it doesn't actually cause any lasting damage don't be a baby uh, yeah, yeah. But, but also in terms of what you're talking about with the information space, part of what Google and Facebook in particular profit from is not taking responsibility for curating the information space, right? They right. refuse to be called media companies. Um, and, you know, one of the things that I thought was really striking was Facebook's Holocaust denial policy. Could you tell us a little bit about that? 
I, I have to admit that that's uh, you need to tell me about that, the Holocaust denial. Policy. Yeah, there was something about how Facebook uh, refuses to will only block Holocaust deniers if the government yeah. is going to make an issue of it. But, but there's a bigger issue here. Look, these guys have amazing platforms. They're, they're great. We all use them. I don't use Facebook, but I use Twitter. I use LinkedIn. They're platforms that allow us to say anything we want which is great and, and they've been amazing in so many different ways, but they've got to take responsibility. They're not, they, they're, they're pretending as if they're not media companies. So you can put any crap on there, anything, anything hateful about minorities, women, lies, stuff paid for by who knows who. And they have to grow up, they have to become accountable. They are 21st century newspapers or, 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 or movie studios. YouTube is, is the modern, the contemporary movie studio. Facebook is the contemporary newspaper. And they won't acknowledge it. And why won't they acknowledge their media companies? Because it forces them to become accountable. It forces them to actually employ editors, human beings to check whether people, what people are saying is firstly legal, lawful, and secondly, whether they are who they claim to be. That's all we're asking. We're well, not, we don't I, want I, censorship. I do sympathize with these companies in you that do? regard. Yes, because <laughs> because now you're getting into a very sticky area. So here's here's you make a distinction in the book, and this is something that I I agree with. Um, there are two issues. One is when someone puts a whole bunch of like a hatred, a hate video, or just you know whatever it might be yeah. on YouTube or or a blog that's you know all about live beheadings. Be. Uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. <laughs> and and those companies are attaching advertising to those yeah. videos and making money. Yeah. Now we now we're into a different subject. Now now. And I think all of them, I think Tim Cook and Zuckerberg and all these guys would be very sympathetic to that argument and probably are and probably have taken measures to not profit well, on Cook these things. Well, certainly would be because obviously his company is different. But look, these guys but, thought but, but they let me, discovered... Let me just finish. Let me, Sorry, yeah, go on. Go on. My, my, my point is that then... Okay, so so I think they would all agree that we, they want to make money off of live beheadings, etc. And they probably are putting... They, they have methodology in place to make sure that that isn't the case. Um, Things slip through the crack, but now um, also I don't know that Facebook and and uh, Google should be, or at least YouTube and things should be in the business of editing free speech. You know, free speech. No, but I just said that they yeah. shouldn't be. I agree. I yeah. mean, you should be allowed to say whatever you like, right? But you have to be accountable for illegal stuff, and you have to be accountable if people are posting stuff uh, how, how claiming you, to be. Well, you're clear. I mean, we've seen this with the election that you're claiming to be Joe from uh, Joe from uh, from Michigan, and you're actually Vladimir from Moscow, mm. and and you're being paid by Putin to pretend to be Joe from uh, Michigan, so that you can screw up American democracy. They're accountable for that. They can't have it both ways. Look, they thought they discovered the holy grail in economic terms, which in a way they had. They could become media companies without paying professionals. So these amazing platforms, we all publish on them. They don't pay us anything. It's free, and they sell advertising around that. It's a great, it's, a, it's, it's, the incre it's an incredible business it model. It sure is. That's why these companies are so huge. Yeah. They are the five, as you mentioned, those five companies are the five largest companies in the world. Way bigger than any bank, any oil company. The seventh company. largest economy in the world, right? I mean, right, you put the five of them together, they could, you know, they could buy most countries in the world. But so no, they, but but you they know, got you know, to be, but Andrew, you can't have it both ways. So if you're gonna benefit from the business model, you have to be accountable when people are cheating, when they're pretending to be someone they're not, or whether they're posting illegal stuff. But I think, I actually think, and I, and I think you actually touched on this in the book later on, I think that it's up to us as consumers to right. be accountable. Yeah, I'm not right. getting fooled by a bot. I'm telling you right now. You know? I, I, well, I'm a bot. Well, listen, listen. <laughs> I know. I knew it. I knew it. Take his face off. Propellers. <laughs> Damn it! He's a cyborg. You've got to vet these people better. I'm Hunter. Sorry. I'm sorry, Brian. I'm I sorry. Knew, I knew he was a cyborg, a sexy one, but the still T1000. I know he felt so real. But but um, but I, I think it's. Up I to don't us. buy it's that. How do us. you know? How do you know that Joe from Joe from Michigan on Facebook is not Vladimir from Moscow? Well, here's so here's the solution, and you talk about it. Blockchain. There is right. there is technology, right. and there will be a market solution in that. I want to make sure where I get my information. I don't agree with a lot of what the New York Times says, um, but I but I read it because I I assume they have a they have a long standing tradition of vetting 
you know, sort of yeah. real from, from false. Exactly. And so does The Economist, and so does Time Magazine, so does Newsweak, so does, and uh, Wall, so does Street, the Wall Street Journal. Even Fox, which exactly. I hate. I, I'm guessing yeah, you probably I don't, hate. I don't like them either. I but mean, the people on it are for real. I mean, they may seem the, weird and right. where they actually come from, something that you can't but, but imagine. You, but you trust that they've, they've been sourced, and when they report something... Yeah, I mean, even something, Bill O'Reilly's real. Exactly. And so, so in that sense... I think what you're going to see is because all of us and no one in this country and really probably the world are really um, sure of the sources, right? We already, there's a built-in paranoia now. And all of us know and it resonates that, well, where, where did you get your sources from? We can't even agree. That's what's destroying the national narrative, right? So if that's the case, I think what you're going to find through blockchain and these other technologies that you touch on in yeah. the book, you're going to find uh, companies that say, look, uh, we are going to create our own news cycle, and it has been vetted to the nth degree, and, 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 and it's a subscription paid policy. So I think because we all, human beings, want to know what the truth is. And the truth defined as what really fucking happened here? What really happened? And it's right? accountable. we got to be accountable. These companies have got to be accountable. Uh -huh. So in the book, I go to Estonia which is using blockchain-like technologies to make people more accountable. Explain that to us for a second, because uh, I love the Estonia. Well, the Estonian mm -hmm. government, which is the most advanced, electronically, digitally advanced company, uh, country in the world, is creating a, a big data kind of state. Now, that might chill some of the, the viewers, and in a way it is chilling. Everything's going to be known in the future, whether we like it or not. But what Estonia is doing is creating a new kind of social contract between citizen and government. This is the, the government saying, sure, we can see what you're doing all the time, health, car, whatever you're doing, we can watch. But the deal is that we will watch you if we think it's necessary and we will tell you. Mm. And it goes back the other way. The technology makes it, makes it so that you can't get away with not, as soon as it's viewed, you get alerted. Exactly. And it also works in media terms where the ideal arrangement in Estonia is everyone has a digital identity. So when you, when you make a comment on an Estonian uh, newspaper website, people know who you are. Yeah. And now some people say, that, well, that's not fair. Why isn't it fair? When you and I sit across each other, we know who we are. I'm not going to say something outrageous. Mm. to your face mm -hmm. and not take accountability mm -hmm. and we need to build that same kind of responsibility and accountability into the digital world as we do into the real world so the estonians are pioneering that that doesn't always work i mean in singapore I'm, i have a chapter in singapore i'm slightly more ambivalent because singapore democracy is Equine, more yeah, yeah. questionable yeah and he then we have the other night. It's a benevolent dictatorship. It's a benevolent, but but it is genuinely benevolent and seems to be loved, at least mm. by many of the Singaporean yeah. people I spoke to. And then we have the Chinese model, which is truly Orwellian, mm -hmm. where they know everything and they're determining what job you get um, or where you live according to your sort of po political reliability. So, so. In the future, there's going to be a number of different kind of digital arrangements. The Estonian model, in my view, in traveling around the world, looks a lot better, certainly slightly better than Singapore, the only and a worry, way though, better than, than China. The, the only worry with the Estonian model and any of these models where, where the government, where it's sort of this quid pro quo, is, of course, if you have a benevolent, rational government, if you have people in power who are on the same page as the populace, but history usually shows us that a guy like Trump will come along, an authoritarian, and for a thousand reasons, usually for the security of the people, yeah. will figure out a way to, you know, w w in certain instances, we can check your data without you knowing about it because it's, it's, we, we're trying to keep the world safe from terrorism, etc. And that's the only, right. that's the I only agree. danger. But the rise of these, new, of these new authoritarians, whether it's Trump, whether it's Erdogan in, China, in Turkey, mm. whether it's Duarte in the uh, Philippines, it's all bound up with digital society, digital media, the degeneration of conversation, a sort of a paranoia that seems to be affecting everyone. So you can't separate. The you mean right. so, so because because sometimes you can you can create your own echo chamber and somebody in power can manipulate uh, information the way Trump does, right? Right, and uh, it, you know, in our echo chamber culture, when someone like Trump says, "Well, the the FBI is." against me 
or the banks are against me, or the st you know even now the stock market's against me. He's such a narcissist. He's so incapable or unwilling to escape himself mm. and imagine that not the world does not actually revolve around him. It's incredible. Um, it's impossible. In that paranoid world, we seem to be living in a similar kind of echo chamber culture where more and more people understand that no one's talking to one another that's the that's the real tragedy of the internet it was supposed to be this platform where everyone would talk to one another different races different cultures different political opinions and it's making us McLuhan Marshall McLuhan the great uh, Canadian futurist came up with the term uh, global village mm -hmm. and he meant it ironically he meant that we would become villages. And of course, the village-like metaphor is really useful because that, that was when we were truly paranoid. I love cities. I love Los Angeles. I love London. I love New York because they're big, tolerant, open places. The internet isn't like that. It's much more like a village. Mm. Yeah, where people can kind of like find like-minded people and, and masturbate, with their, and, masturbate and, with their own ideas. Right, and, and convince themselves. It's like, it, but it's not just the internet. I mean, Fox is like that. MSNBC is yeah. like that. When Very you watch so. these things, it's like watching state propaganda. It, re because it really there's is. Never, there's never <laughs> any... It's not objective. There's never any ambivalence. There's never any no. uncertainty. Well, maybe these people are right here and wrong here. Yes. And that's about us all growing up and understanding that the world is an incredibly complicated place and isn't just made up of is extreme Is that an American thing, though? Like Hunter was are we talking gonna about grow, uh, How long have we been going in this interview before we start bashing Americans? Yeah, I was going to say, <laughs> let's, uh, I mean, come on. Let's, let's, let's get to the main fun. event. <laughs> but Americans tend to be rather... Um, uh, polarizing and in, in, uh, polarized in, in that they can never be both things, right? It's, it's so much easier yeah. to be either one thing or another. I always find, and I think Trevor Noah talked about that, can you not be pro Black Lives Matter and pro cop? Is that, a, is that possible? Can we, can, and, you know, can we bridge this gap? This sort of the, this, there was this feminist uh, writer who was saying that the new feminism is, is so anti sexual in general. And that sex yeah. is all being cast as one thing, which is a power dynamic, and men have the power over women. And it, what it does is it kind of kills sex, it kills the danger, and it kills the unpredictability and the fun. Yeah, you've got to be careful here, though. Have you got any female viewers? Well, no, of course you have to be careful. What a surprise <laughs> that I have to be careful, right? Because even that can be taken out of context, and now I'm... And women... You know, this one feminist writer, I can't remember her name, um, she was, she's being called all kinds of names by the other feminists. So, so oh, we're yeah. very polarized in this yeah. country. I don't know if that's an American thing. I think phenomenon. we have to be careful here. I think it's all too easy because the internet was an American thing in the first place, although mm. it isn't anymore. It's also easy to, for a critique of the internet to be turned into a way of bashing Americans. And I think the problems are very similar around the world. Yeah. Uh, Shum, so Shum I, I, I think that... Um, I think that uh, it's, it, I, I have that problem actually with my work is in Europe, I, I'm very, I'm actually ironic, maybe not ironically, maybe unsurprisingly, I, in, in many ways, I'm more, my work is more popular in Europe, mm. particularly in Germany and Northern Europe. But I fear sometimes that's because they just look at my stuff and they think, oh, this is the guy that bashes America. So, uh, uh, so in Germany, my last book, uh, The Internet's Not the Answer, which is an interesting ambivalent title, was translated into German as Der Digital Debacle. <laughs> which is, is the hardly digital sophisticated. Debacle? Yeah. <laughs> so do, but doesn't this come down to different priorities? Like in America, there's a real trust in the free market and a yeah. fear of the government. And in Europe, there's a real trust in the government and a fear of the free market. I mean, to simplify things down. But I, I think that's true. And I think one of the arguments I make in this book and in The Internet's Not the Answer is that the Internet was an experiment in the free market. The, the Silicon Valley guy said, look, just leave us alone. If the, market, if the market just works itself out, we're going to have amazing products, companies, a continual cycle of innovation. It will be great for the little guy, great for the entrepreneur, great for the investor, great for Americans. Actually, when it's been completely left alone, I quote Karl Polyani, the American, uh, the, the Hungarian-American, famous Hungarian economist, who, who always critiqued this idea as a kind of economic utopianism. Uh, it's actually resulted not in more democracy, but in less 
democracy in a tiny group of winner-take-all companies and winner-take-all cultures and, and compounded inequality and created all the big social problems of our age. The Europeans are much better at the regulation side. They're much less good on the innovation. We need both. Mm. You can't do without one or the other. You, so draw, it's you draw a great distinction there, too. You, you this great uh, sort of comparison between how cars in unsafe at any speed it was the germans that came up with this so so it sort of was the it was chevrolet's modus operandi to get you to buy a new car every year so the corvair yeah. was a coffin but it was really awesome looking and everything else and and before ralph nader came along and wrote that book which saved so many lives you know it wasn't until the uh volkswagen and especially daimler benz came along and said wait a minute there's a way to make these cars safer yeah. so they they kind of regulated and and you know it's a good example of as i i've always called myself a libertarian but let me tell you as you get older, you realize that the government with the Clean Food Act or the Pure Food Act... Uh, you don't sound like a libertarian. Uh, no. He's a recovering libertarian. I like pretending I am because I don't really... But as I, as, I, as I speak to more people like yourself and I read your work, you know, there are a lot of examples where the government came in, regulation saved yeah. lives, and we live with it every day and wouldn't want to otherwise. The fact that cars were made safer, that's not a but bad I think thing. A, this is the core of the book. Is that I, I argue that there are five kind of tools we've always had for fixing the future, and, and our period's no different. There's innovation, the market, which mm -hmm. is great. There's regulation, the government, which also has value. But there's also consumer behavior. Mm -hmm which is the car example. Consumers, no one was forcing people not to buy American cars in the mid 60s. Nader came out with a book, Ralph Nader saying, I'm safe at any speed. Uh, American cars are coffins. Consumers woke up and they started buying German and Japanese cars. We know the history since. Yep. So consumer activism is really important. 100%. Citizen activism, of course, citizen engagement, wanting to make the world a better place is really important. And education. So those five tools are really important today as they were in the industrial revolution i remind people that's the way we create agency that's how we shape the future rather than the, sh the future shaping well, us and, and this but it's not just one thing no it's always too easy to say no, it's it's just regulation yeah. just innovation just consumers just education just citizen activism it needs to be all five well i notice that there's a there's a consumer malaise though there's this idea and and, and that's why education is very important when you what do you mean these, a malaise well, well so in other words if you have uh, or almost a, a learned helplessness when you have these four especially these four massive companies as a consumer you don't know how to fix it i until i started reading your book i'm not kidding i i just didn't know how to fix this i just assumed that youtube when i put my stuff on youtube that i was going to see pennies and that's just the way it was and that's the way that that's but it the never way this occurred to you you had millions of viewers and you were getting pennies and well, they were making all the money well i w w <laughs> right. no I mean, because because the way i look at it is i make money, is I, ma I make my money on the road so so when i when i put so out a special i yeah. put a special i'm not seeing money for that i give that out there everybody sees it and then they come see me live just like and you sell t-shirts <laughs> you sell t-shirts you do all that stuff actually <laughs> exactly so luckily i i found my way right in this in this thing but for the most part yeah. I just assumed that's technology, that's the future, and I better figure out a way to work around it. Well, Whereas, did you look at, say, pa Patreon and yes. these new platforms that are enabling you to create direct relationships with your viewers, yeah. your followers, yes. and a much fairer arrangement so that they're not taking everything off the table? The problem with these, whether it's YouTube or Uber or Airbnb, they're the classic middlemen. They're earning... 30, 40% of yeah. the exchange without essentially doing anything, just sitting in the middle. Why Why do we give, you know, we take our Ubers. Ubers is a great service. Everyone uses it all the time. But when I, when I, when I, uh, I shouldn't use this word, hook up with uh, an Uber driver. <laughs> Sometimes you do. <laughs> right. you never know. When I connect with an Uber driver. Like you're Andrew Keeney. Your brain is so big. <laughs> Oh my God! You've got a full head of hair too, and that. Let's accent. just pull this Uber over. Right. Let's pull that over. Yeah. Go Next on. time, yeah. Well, you can come in with the Uber. Notice, with how, me. notice how you can't tell if it's a man or woman. Go on. Let me finish with Uber. Yeah. Why, why is Uber taking 40, 40 50 percent of the exchange right. when all I need is a ride? All they need is a is a is a rider, 
And so these new, and, and the same is true of YouTube. You know, YouTube, okay, they, they had a lead when it comes to video views, but what else are they providing you? This is gonna go on YouTube, they just have a platform. Right. But why are they taking 30 or 40% of the revenue? Because none of us know what the alternative is. Well, until a new technology like blockchain comes along. It's until decentralized, along. It's, it's what we're talking about. I have a whole chapter on this, and this is the, the big new thing in tech is the re-decentralization. And yes. everyone's talking about that, where it's, you know, the original architects of the web, people like Tim Berners-Lee and Vince Cerf, who created the, 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 the technology that enables this stuff, and a new wave of innovators. So we can't just rely on regulators. As a new spirit, I think, of democracy brewing. Now, I don't think we can So explain overboard. that to it. I love this, because th that was the, one of my favorite parts. Of That's why I say your book, I felt so pessimistic, and as I read, yeah. I became really optimistic because there is a movement to decentralize the internet. There is a movement to fight the four horsemen of the apocalypse, or the five four horsemen of the apocalypse, right? And VCs are on board as well. The VCs don't like this situation anymore. You know, VCs get vilified because they're rich, okay, but they're smart people. They're mm -hmm. the kings of the jungle, but they don't want this five five Kills horsemen of the apocalypse doesn't help them yeah. so one of the chapters in the book features an event by a berlin-based venture capital company called blue yard uh, blue yard capital um, which is really focusing on investing in these decentralized networks which do away with the middlemen and, and enable creative types like yourself to create direct relationships with their followers uh, we have a similar thing going on on the East Coast with venture capitalists from Union Square Ventures. There's a guy called Albert Wenger I, I interview in the book. They're on board this. They, they, they want to re-stimulate innovation. The problem is, is that we're back in 1997. You remember in 97, Microsoft controlled everything, wanted to do away with all innovation because they wanted to make the web essentially an extension of Microsoft. Yeah. But regulators looked at Microsoft, they didn't formally break them up, but they took their attention long enough so that Google and Facebook and Web 2.0 exploded. We're at a similar time where we need to re-stimulate the, the innovation economy. It needs to come both from regulation, which tends to be coming from Europe, but also from some interesting antitrust stuff now happening in the US. I think Obama, by the way, who I admire as a president in overall terms, I think his digital policy was a catastrophe. I think he was in the pocket mercy of Silicon Valley, and he was as deluded as anyone about the real impact of this. So we need both regulation and innovation, but it's starting to brew, and you're right, blockchain is a really interesting technology, because firstly it creates accountability, but it also may enable this re-decentralization movement. Can you explain what blockchain is? Blockchain is, and I knew you were going to ask that, it's a <laughs> hard one. Um, blockchain is a technology that creates a kind of transparent ledger, which means you can't lie anymore with blockchain. Once it's established, it's visible to everyone. So it has really interesting ramifications in terms of corruption. Uh, developing countries can use blockchain to make sure that the records don't change. You can't fiddle with blockchain. Once blockchain is enabled within an information system, everything essentially becomes true and transparent. Mm. And it's enabling a new wave. Uh, having said that, though, some people say uh, Don Tapscott is a friend of mine, is a Canadian kind of futurist. He's written a book about blockchain. Uh, he says that blockchain is the new internet which I think is a dangerous idea because I don't think blockchain, blockchain can save us. Technology isn't the solution to the problems of technology, mm -hmm. nor is trashing technology. I'm anything but a Luddite, but the solutions need to be human. So blockchain is interesting, but there's no app to fix the future. There's no single have technology. You, have you spoken to Jeff Bezos ever? Um, he's got this new technology where you, you have wristbands for yeah. his employees. Well, I have a great Jeff Bezos story in 2000 and uh, eight, I was talking, I was in LA at the, uh, 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 the uh, Getty Museum doing a speech about Cult of the Amateur. So I go in after I do the speech, sort of throw a few bombs because it was an entertainment kind of audience, go and take a piss in the men's room. So I'm doing my business and then there's this voice behind me and it's Cult of the Amateur and this deep laughter and I turn around and it was him. Oh. So uh, we had this nice chat in the bathroom. I told him that Amazon had crushed my first company, Audio Cafe, which he was rather amused with. <laughs> and, and I'm a big admirer of Bezos. But I'm also, you know, I think he, he's our greatest hope. 
In terms of these, huh. me- I think he is a mensch. I don't think Zuckerberg is. I think Zuckerberg's still a kid. I think the Google guys are geeks. I think Cook is essentially a bureaucrat. But I think Bezos is the huh. greatest figure to come out of tech since, certainly since Jobs. And in many ways, he may be greater than Jobs. Wow. He's incredibly articulate. He's amazingly smart. And I think he has to start really pulling his finger out and taking responsibility. He came out with a tweet few months ago, I put it in the book, saying, uh, asking people what he should do with his money, what kind of philanthropy. Yes, so I, I kind of it, respond yeah. to him in the book. He's capable of confronting some of these huge, huge issues, whether it's the impact of technology on jobs, whether it's um, the surveillance economy, whether it's inequality. He has, he's tackling health care, isn't he? With yeah, and he's, and... you're already seeing the American government doesn't work. Yeah. So you're seeing people like Bezos step <clears> in. Now, that could be scary to some people. He's responsible, he's accountable, but he needs to be. I mean, we need to keep an eye on him. I'm not saying that he's enormously trustworthy. I, I mean, I'm, I'm in my last book, I was very critical of Amazon. I don't like their labor practices. I don't think I'd want to work for Amazon. I don't think I'd get a job there. Uh, but he is a grown-up, and I think mm. he understands. If there's anyone who understands their responsibility, he may be the Carnegie of the 21st century. Really? And also this gets to the core of what the problem is, which is power divorced from responsibility. Right. Which I think is the real issue, and that is the real issue with the big five, right? Is, is that if you have a king, right, a king has power. And the question is, is the king accountable to the people? Does the king have responsibility? We should be fair, though. To Zuckerberg's stated goal is to give away 99% of his wealth. Well, but that's yeah, the but whole that's point. A sort of childish, and that's the arms yeah. racing, giving away your money. And as I suggest in the book, even Zuckerberg's attempt to give away his money is complicated because it seems to be connected with yeah. some way of not paying tax <laughs> so it's it's not as simple as it seems yeah. and, and he does it but i you know as with the, with the education example he, he's been rather immature so far in terms of how he's given his money away and to give you an inside scoop on the zuckerbergs because i went to school with them i went to school in particular with randy zuckerberg yeah. who i did uh you know student written musical theater with <laughs> and then at the end of 2006 randy is his sister, his sister yeah mm-hmm. and at the end of 2016 i don't remember if you remember when like richard b spencer the yeah. alt right guy became popular yeah there was this thing on cnn where somebody who was just some intern or whatever was typing in and he typed up are jews people and he put that on the bottom of the screen are they <laughs> I'm Jewish, I can say that. Right? Okay, good. But so Randy puts up a screenshot of this on Facebook and goes on this whole thing about how deplorable what has happened to our news media and there's no responsibility and blah, 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 blah. And all of, you know, Randy is now surrounded by people who kiss her ass all day. And so all these people rush in and they say, oh, it's terrible, Randy, it's terrible, Randy. In comes the Dutchman, and the Dutchman Hunter just Mons. the Dutchman just puts in the feed. Gee, Randy, if only you were related to someone who had been created the platform that was most responsible for distributing fake news in this election cycle. And what did she say? She said, "How dare you? How, How dare, dare you? you? Yeah, that's a very LA thing to say. Yeah. How dare you? Also said she's hurting and all. Yeah, that. and all that sort so of stuff. So what did you say to How dare you? Well, I said I hope you dared more. <laughs> yeah, I did, and I said, <laughs> what a stupid thing to say. Well, How I said, dare you? What does that mean? It's not her company anyway. No, it's not. She's it's insulting just, her she's brother. Just, she's her just blood related to her brother. Yeah. brother. Yeah. But I, I said, you know, she had made... And the you're a friend. How yeah. dare you, Randy? How dare you, the Dutchman? <laughs> yeah. But, I, you know, I mean, that was that was my point, is, is that if she's... And she said, you know, that she was saw echoes of 1936 in All Germany. Right. And I said, well, if you're really concerned about that, who's your friend? The people who tell you, oh, it's not your fault, you can't do anything about this, or the people who are willing to say, like, there are things you can do about this. That's right. You can- uh, and I'll tell you another thing about Zuckerberg that troubles me. He, very recently, he came out with this... One of his explanations for changing the news feed policy, which I think is also, I'm not convinced he's doing the right thing by sort of retreating from a media policy to a family and friends thing, which only compounds the echo chamber thing. But anyway, he said, well, I'm only really doing this because now I have a responsibility towards my kids. When they grow up, they don't want to, as if their, their dad has destroyed the world. Mm. But this notion that before kids he didn't care about destroying the world, and now it's only having kids that he se- has a sense of accountability and responsibility. I mean, he controls the most m- powerful media platform in the world. He, he should have a responsibility whether or not he has kids. 
and yeah. as a media platform, I mean, think about this in terms of Hollywood. You know, in Hollywood, you know, Walter Cronkite, you have to curate the information space. You don't just put anything or anyone on TV. And you have to think about what you do or do not put on TV. Like, and then, you know, you see this evolution of media towards the 1980s, the 1990s, where increasingly they'll put literally anything on TV to generate eyeballs and to get clicks. But there, you wouldn't find, you know, would, would even CNN, as far as it's fallen, saying, are Jews people, would it put beheadings, pornography, you know, whatever it might other... Put, it might put beheadings if Trump was being beheaded, right, on CNN. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like Black Mirror, yeah. where he has to have sex with um, a pig. Um, but we're not, well, there's not, there's not easy answers for any of I'm this. I'm optimistic, though. I mean, I'm very optimistic after reading the book. Well, I'm optimistic. I mean, we don't seem optimistic, but we, we should be, because there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. It, well, also, people are aware, and I think the people we're talking about, whether it's Zuckerberg or Bezos or Tim Cook or any of them, they are aware. These are intelligent people, and I would, I want to give them the benefit of the doubt, powerful as they may be. Yeah. I think overall, they're trying to make the world a better place. You could be, Even be careful Peter with Thiel? that. You could say that. Sorry? Even Peter Thiel? I don't know. Peter Peter, Peter Thiel, I like, I've listened to Peter Thiel. I think Peter Thiel has um, some very important things to say. Uh, the state of our colleges. Yeah. Um, you know, he's got really good ways of breaking down, like, sort of what higher ed education has become. Again, another man is trying. I, you know, from what I have read, I don't know the man. He's, he's yeah. on, he's probably on the spectrum a little bit. He's sort of a guy who thinks so out of the box. Yeah. And it was almost maybe like he supported Trump just as a general fuck you to the. Yeah. He, you know, you got to have a little pushback to the echo chamber. Who, who do you want? Do you want Hillary Clinton? Do you want Obama light? And did that solve the problems over the past eight years? Yeah. I, you know, I, 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 maybe he even thought he could have some influence on Trump. But I think is, you are right about these guys being inc incredibly... It, th th there was nothing accidental about any of these people making vast fortunes. Right. They are the new super class, you know, this sort of global elite of multi-billionaires. And I think just as they're incredibly, I mean, Bill Gates is the perfect example, just as they were brutal in business, they're also capable of being very responsible as citizens. Mm. The challenge maybe, I'm not sure about this, but the challenge may be to, to stop living their lives as the first half and the second half. So the, the, the classic model is you spend the first half of your life being brutal <laughs> like Gates and destroying all competition, often illegally. Yeah. And then you spend the second half of your life giving your, your ill-gotten gains away. Making now, amends. Th there has to be some way of combining those two. Tough so though. you're not as quite as brutal as a, as, as a business person. Uh, tough, but though. Who, same, knows? Who knows? Maybe that's the same thing that drives them. Yeah. It's very tough. Well, I mean, we'll that, see with, yeah. with Bezos, because I think there's still a lot of the Bezos story to come. He's a fascinating character. And uh, my guess is we, we haven't seen. But he still is destroying retail, isn't he? I mean, he's yeah. absolutely destroying retail. And he's but not, I mean, say he Amazon has destroyed yeah. retail. Yeah. None of us. That's a new technology, anymore. and maybe that's just the that's a, the growing pains. Maybe that is. Are we? Are we? You know, if if I can have something shipped to myself, if I can buy a ping pong table, just but with a couple of clicks, it's a lot easier. Or my book. You know? I hope you're going to plug the book. I mean, yes. people can buy it on Amazon. Even. Yes. How to fix how <laughs> to fix the future. It's a too, right? It's a very important book. Uh, I'm glad you mentioned that because th that is what we're here to do, and we're gonna. And I, I what I do is uh, to my 300,000 followers on on Instagram, I, I put a picture of this book because I have a lot of young men asking me, mostly young men, sorry, I know there are a lot of women as well, but but mostly young men for whatever reason ask me what to read. And I, I, I love this book because it is, um, it's, it's not just complaining about the problems, it's actually giving us, in many ways, a way out. And it's got a nice cover, what do you think of the cover? I think it's adorable, <laughs> How to Fix the Future. Pick. It's got all, it's got, and your, your name, Andrew Keene, in, in a hot pink. A hot pink. That's for my Uber driver. I was going to say. I was going to say. I mean, and we're in this hotel room with a very, that comforter, that bed looks very slept we, in. But we and need otherwise. to thank, I need to give a plug to my girlfriend, Rita, who's actually paying for this hotel room. Rita. And I'm just sharing her bed. So God bless you. Helping us blur the lines between ideas. So who's also a big admirer of uh, Noah. Noah, it, uh, Noah, no, no. Oh, Trevor, Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah. So I'm always telling her. That's because she hasn't seen my show yet, but anyway. Are you better than Trevor? Uh, well, uh, uh, stand-up-wise? <laughs> Noah hasn't been in her bedroom. Sta stand-up-wise, so. I'll get in the ring with anybody on the planet. Let's just put it that way. But let me I'll ask you, this is a serious question, because I'm always having this argument with her. Um, 
What role do comedians play in the degeneration of our culture? Have you guys also undermined seriousness and turned everything into such a farce? Because when I watch Trevor Noah and Jon Stewart and all these other people, there's also a degree of kind of knowing arrogance and undermining seriousness and truth. Is that fair? I mean, I'm saying your work. I would say that, that, that the what I would say is that in many ways, I hate to say this, but, and I have in my next special, I think you'll know, he just saw it, I'm, I'm tackling a lot of these ideas and trying to, clo trying, to, trying to put as much funny around them as I can. But you know, listen, comedy is recess. At the end of the day- Comedy you, is what? It's recess. It what is, does that it mean? Is a, it's a break. It, when you come to see me do stand-up, first and foremost, you're paying a babysitter, you're paying money to come and laugh. Yeah. And my job is to make you laugh your ass off for an hour and 15 minutes. And and there's nothing like that. Whatever that's worth, I don't know, but I don't think we'd want to be alive without it. Does yeah. it provide value? If you really want, if you want considered, if you want considered judgment, and if you want to actually tackle these problems, you gotta read a book like How to Fix the Future. Andrew Keene's your guy, for real. <laughs> That's the guy to, to learn I may and not to be tackle funny, big problems. I can't be a you're comedian pretty, You're like pretty good, you're Noah, pretty good. Trevor yeah, Noah. Yeah, or Brian Callen. Don't, stop <laughs> saying Trevor Noah, he's, he's my youngin' and, and just a little respect, Andrew. But the bottom line is, you know, the, my job first is to make you laugh, your job is to, to, to go and interview all these people, travel the world, and put together this very insightful book. That's a that takes a shitload of effort. I can't do that. Just like you probably can't get on stage and make people laugh really hard for an hour and fifteen minutes. I can't. Well, I'll, I'll challenge you. Come on, baby. Let's go. <laughs> Can I come I, on your my, show? My joke was always my no, first special, as I said. I can't uh, do that. I, I'm, I'm funnier than all the great men, uh, Kepler and Copernicus and Shakespeare and, and, and but even But you're a professional. This comes back to this thing of not everyone can be a comedian, right? I mean, That's there right. must be a lot of wannabes on on youtube <laughs> there are and so so always in I'm, I'm always shocked that i'm able to, to do it yeah yeah and i'm shocked that i'm able to do it i still can't believe i can do it and and so that's my first priority but then i get to talk to people like you and at least have at least contribute to an extent that we're, hunter and i always talk about getting these ideas that are stuck in books out of those books and into the minds well this is uh, I, I mean i'm plugging my own book here but to what i what i'm proud about this book is it's pretty easy to read. It's not one of these he heavy books that's really complicated. No. It's a simple narrative. You know, it's a story of me going around the world from Estonia to Singapore to India to Russia to Germany to Silicon Valley, talking with people about how to fix stuff. And this stuff is, isn't complicated and shouldn't be complicated. When you get these long books that make it complicated, that's one of the reasons why we're not fixing the future. Right. We've got to simplify it. We've got to make it accessible. And the core, the core thing in the, in the book, in the first chapter, is called Moore's Law. It's mm -hmm. not Gordon Moore's law, you know, about the doubling of computer power every 18 months. It's Thomas Moore, yep. the 16th century English author of Utopia. Again, that might seem rather forbidding. Put to death by Henry VIII because he refused but, but, to. But in Utopia, Moore argues that the future, that societies are made good when we display human agency, when we control it. Mm -hmm. So agency is the key here. It's Moore's law, Thomas Moore's law, not Gordon Moore's right. law. And right. I think, you know. And, and I, I want to just say, piggyback on that for a second, and I want you to. Uh, and I'm not blowing smoke up your ass, but r reading uh, <laughs> The Gulf of the Amateur and reading How to Fix the Future, the, the, when I, sometimes you read a book and you go, man, this encapsulates the problem and in many ways the solution, or at least the direction of the solution, and uh, everybody needs to read it. Because if we read it, we'd be more literate. We'd be more, we, not that we, we would be more um, informed and we'd be more aware of what the problem is, where the problem is going, and how to stop the problem. And that's what I like about that. And it's a beginning. Look, this, I think yeah. one of the problems with um, sort of contemporary culture is we think we're, we're very impatient and we think things can be fixed really simply. Um, and all we need is an app for that. Oh, well, you know, fake news, we just need an app. These are big problems. That's mm -hmm. why I compare it to the Industrial Revolution. The Industrial Revolution didn't get fixed for 100 years. It took mm -hmm. generations to fix this stuff about working conditions and pollution still hasn't been fixed, about inequality, about the future of jobs. And the Digital Revolution is so profound. It's not just Facebook or Twitter. It's how we organize ourselves. This is the next big thing. This is shaping our whole future. We're inventing machines that are so smart they can do most of what we can do. They may not be able to do what you do, or perhaps what I do, but they can do most of the stuff. They're going to be machines that can film stuff like this, that can drive our cars, that can make our food. So what becomes of us? This is mm -hmm. a huge issue. Yeah. Well, and part of what you talk in the book is the precariat. 
Right, this new precariat. Karl Marx invented the term proletariat, the wage laborers of the 19th century worked in the factories. Today now we're the precariat. We drive our Uber in the morning, uh, we work task rabbit in the afternoon, and we rent our homes out on Airbnb in the evening. Now some people say that's great, it gives us freedom. It is great in a way, but when the Uber driver is being ripped off, when they're not getting properly paid, when all the money on the table is being taken by those middlemen, whether it's Airbnb, or Uber, or TaskRabbit, that's really troubling. And it's also, it, you said that, that the four horsemen of the apocalypse employ probably a total of 500,000 people. So yeah. a lot of that money may not be trickling down to the people that, you know. It's not. It's part of the, this, this, this sort of modern, archi this contemporary architecture of inequality in America and in the world. The, the people of the, the hinterland, if you like, the middle America, flyover, whatever you want to call it, they're not sharing in the wealth of Facebook or Google. In my last book, I went to Rochester, New York, which was the headquarters of, of Kodak. I documented the crisis of Kodak, the collapse of Kodak, which at its height employed about 300,000 people. What did it get replaced by? Instagram, that was bought when it was bought by Facebook for one and a half billion dollars, employed 15 people. 15 people, Jesus. It's like Craigslist, same thing. Right. And I, I think you know? the important- but, but just to come back to Craigslist, at least, and then I point out this book in the book, Craig Newmark, who was a great guy and one of the best people in Silicon Valley, he got it. He saw his responsibility. And having done very well out of um, Craigslist, or no, not as well as he could have done, he spent the rest of his life actually trying to figure out solutions to the crisis of journalism. The very system that he disintermediated kind of by accident. You know, Craigslist undermined local newspapers because they disintermediated advertising. So Craig understood that and now has donated much of his wealth towards figuring out new models for journalism. So that's a really positive model, Craig mm. Newman. And that's the important thing about creative destruction. You've created something, but you've also destroyed something. Yeah. And, you know, all of these big tech companies have destroyed the lives of a lot of people. And there has to be responsibility for the fact that you got all this power, you got all this money right. by destroying the ecosystem for all these other people. Now, how do you help them? So say, I don't know. Tough though, tough. It, it, it's Kevin Sistrom was the founder of Instagram. I don't know if he's a billionaire. He's certainly close. He's done really well very brilliant guy went to Stanford and all the rest of it but I don't see the same commitment on someone like Sistrom to the sort of the destruction of the traditional photography industry manifested by the collapse of Kodak in the same way as Craig Newmark took responsibility or is taking responsibility for the crisis of journalism so it, it they're not to blame no one's to blame everyone's a businessman everyone's trying to innovate but you have to understand there's a lot of accidental consequences of your behavior and if you grow very rich through not on your own fault but as a accidental consequence uh, unemployment of m large sectors of the economy, then you should take responsibility. In the same way as I think Bezos has to accept that he has a responsibility for the collapse of retail. When you go around this country, I mean, the mouths are being destroyed. And that was the, the, the source of many ordinary people's work. The malls, you're saying? Malls, what did I say? Mouths, mouths. malls. Oh, the mouths. Mouths. Sorry, the yes. mouths. Sorry, so that's mouths. now Sorry, the correct he's pronunciation. He's a foreigner. foreigner. Even though it's a global village, he's a foreigner. He's from that I'm other a, neighborhood. I'm a foreigner of the village. in a global village. He's a foreigner. The mouths. I love that his American accent sounds like uh, Anthony Hopkins in Science of the Lambs. Yes, of course it does. Foreigner. Yes, he's even got that. I, I, I thought I'd got to a point where English people all think I'm an American, and no. Americans all think I'm English. Where in England are you from? London. Oh, London, of course. North so many London. different accents. In North London. London. So many different That's accents. That's a good name. North London. Yeah. North London. I'm from North, North London. London. That's right. Yeah. Sort yeah. Of a, no, that's East London, isn't it? <laughs> that's sort East of, London. Sort of a cockney. Um, I'm really good with accents. Andrew <laughs> Keane, this has been fun, man. How to Fix the, in the Future. A very important book. And I'm going to... When is it? Is it available now? It's available right now. It came today. out as we talk today. Today? Seriously? Tuesday. Dude, I'm, I don't I'm know gonna, when. When's this coming out? I'll Instagram the shit out of this, and tweet it, and then uh, my job is to get you on some other big podcasts. Yeah, you absolutely. Well, I feel like the, Tim Ferriss is would really this the like you. Well, I know Tim. I, I uh, Tim and I shared the same agent. Yeah, and Tim's we good started out together, so I know him quite well. So yeah. yeah, remind him of my existence. He's a buddy of mine. I'll, I'll text him. Yeah. yeah. And, no, Tim uh, is a good guy. Gotta get and, Tim on here. Yep. I love Tim. And uh, yeah, no, I'd love to. I like. Uh, 
you, I want to have my own podcast. So now here's what you need to plug your audience. I need you say I need a partner, yeah. a young, sexy type. Yeah. Yeah, I think Andrew Keen has a very important message, and uh, he, I think you need uh, probably a comedian who's interested in these ideas, or uh, not an actor, um, but I don't know. I feel like somebody who is um, funny. Yeah, just somebody who's got their pulse on the pop culture. Who's what about not Trevor as... Noah? I think he, I've heard Trevor? he's really good. <laughs> I heard he's good. Yeah, Trevor's he's got nothing to do, right? But yeah, why not? Why not someone like Trevor Noah? Or somebody not who's not quite as busy as Trevor. Would you want someone in the Bay Area? Well, I travel a lot. No, not necessarily. New York. I'm in New York all the time. Yeah. LA, you, anyway. You I'm looking be... for... I think you're right on the partnership thing. I think um, people, you know, are able to work. A, a good yeah. chemistry. No, I like the podcast m medium. I think it's great. Yeah. Although, I never understand. I always thought podcasts were audio. How is this video? Because uh, people watch it on YouTube. Like, we get... Like, but is just, that a... Can you watch a... I thought you don't yeah, listen to people like to it. it. I don't know why, but they do. They like no, to. I understand that. But Look at my it, jawline. When you watch it, it's no longer a podcast. It's something else. It's a vidcast. Whatever, dude. <laughs> right. Stop trying to create another category. We don't need any more categories, Andrew Keen. You're supposed to be fighting that. Or maybe you're not. Maybe you're... you're maybe we're decentralizing. I don't know. The point is, they're going to be looking at me because look at how soft my eyes are, yet how strong my face is. I mean, don't you want people holding, Brian Callen holding your book? Like, isn't that the ultimate oh, yeah, product yeah, placement? That'll sell it. <laughs> yeah, that'll sell it. There's some vulgar yeah, kind of holding yeah. my, Brian holding my book. That's right. The, medium, the medium white <laughs> on, guy. The medium white guy. On camera, live. Yeah. Yeah, no, Brian needs to hold my book. All right, let me hold Don't it. Hold let me hold it. it. Watch this. Oh, God, it feels so good. Again, hot pink up top. Sort of a purple. And a Walter, I a Walter Isaacson quote at yeah. the bottom. That my agent a bracing said, book. How about that? Walter Isaacson, it's a bracing book. I don't know what the hell that even means. I, <laughs> I know it's a good book, and I really enjoyed it. And uh, uh, it here's, after years up. of giddiness about the wonders of technology, a new realization is dawning. The future is broken. Andrew Keen was among the first and most insightful to see it. The combination of the digital revolution, global hyperconnectivity, and economic dysfunction has led to a populist backlash and destruction of civil discourse. In this bracing book, Keen offers tools for writing our societies and principles to guide us in the future. That's kind of a big deal. Walter Isaacson, New York Times bestselling author of Steve Jobs and Leonardo da Vinci, both books I've read. Thank you, Walter. Walter. Yeah, um, you've got some great. Well, you you know you deserve it. I mean, come on, it, it really, really well, is. Gonna, uh, can you? Great. Will you blurb my next book? Look at this. The most compelling, yes, persuasive, and passionately negative negative thing I've read on this topic. <laughs> Kazuyo Ishiguro, which is a New Statesman book. Books yeah, but that guy just won the Nobel Prize for literature. Yeah, so Nobel laureate. Yeah, my mm -hmm. wife is reading all his books right now. Yeah, he's a brilliant writer. I mean, that's pretty badass that you got that from him. Uh, you know, this is great. And uh, Washington Post, an enormously useful primer for those of us connected that online life isn't as shiny as our digital avatars would like us to believe. And uh, all of which I agree with. It's uh, an important. And book. I think at the end of the day, really what this all comes down to is, this, you know, the age old adage that power corrupts and absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. Lord you Acton. Know, yeah, and the point is, is there's, it's not that Zuckerberg or Bezos or Sister How Marie, these guys, are bad guys, but all people need to be held accountable. And yeah. that's what a democracy is about, is about accountability, power with yeah, responsibility. Yeah, that's why they, they stood back from their platforms. They create the platforms. They have a responsibility. It's, it's obvious. Everybody knows How do that. you, Andrew, when you write a book like this, is there a deep sense of satisfaction, or are you now kind of like, what do I write next? And, and how do you... Yeah, I mean, you know, kind of. But what, what do you feel after a good performance? Do you want to think about tomorrow? Or? Yeah, well, so when I when I shoot my special, right, I have to throw it all out and start again. You know, but a lot of times you're preoccupied with the same questions, um, and one of the hardest things for me was to kind of like change my, the question I was preoccupied with. You know, sort yeah. of. Uh, and then step outside myself. You know, a lot of it. This stuff is autobiographical. Yeah. Or what's bothering you, and you can't kick it, and then. You know, you wrestle with, I think a lot of authors are, are preoccupied with the same question. And what happens is you can exhaust that question and then you have to come up with another question. Well, I wrote three books pointing out all the problems. So this book, I think, is a departure. I mean, It is. A, it is because it, it, it's giving it's us... It's positive yeah. and it's creative and say, okay, we know the problems, so how do we fix them? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think the challenge as an author is not to, is, is, is unless you're Shakespeare not or something, himself. is not to keep on writing the same book. Yeah. The challenge is writing something different. So... Yeah, you're always thinking, well, what's the next book? And now you're sitting and waiting for something. The best to hit period, you. I think, is having turned in the final manuscript. And mm -hmm. then you have about three or four months 
where you have absolutely no responsibilities, where you're exhausted, so you go away, you've got nothing to do. And then when the book comes out, it becomes real, and then you've got to work on new, new ideas, new ways of making a living. I mean, a book doesn't support you, certainly doesn't support you forever. So yeah. as a writer, and I, I'm really lucky to have an amazing publisher, Grove Atlantic, the CEO of the company, Morgan Entrican, is also the editor of the book. It was his idea, his title. He's amazingly supportive. So he, he's an example of how the old system works. He's a curator. He has very high quality, very high standards. So when he says to you, this needs some work, he means it's crap. You need to start again. But, you know, his book, uh, his book on Vietnam, his novel about Vietnam, uh, the, the, was it the AS Secret Agent, uh, won the, the Pulitzer Prize. And that's your that's your that's your yeah so he, he's wow. a great guy but he's a he's an independent so he's not one of the mega mega sort of the harper collins thank god for guys Berkelsman like that types yeah. yeah well that's that's i i'm i feel the same way about you so you know i think it, it took a lot of effort it took a lot of effort to write this so thank you so much for doing mixed mental arts this is brian Callen, hunter Motz. we thank you formally thank you Andrew real King. honor and real fun i hope i'll be on again you you will not too anytime you want uh, uh, yeah anytime? anytime anytime man anytime brother all right ladies and gentlemen i hope you learned everything bye-bye